Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, and our valued online attendees, good morning, afternoon, night, wherever you are, online or on site. Uh, I am Nicolas Fiumarelli, 33 years old, and proud former youth ambassadors. I was uh, a youth ambassador as you in 2019 in the cohort of the Internet Societies program. Today, as we convene to the significant session, uh, we are reminded of the cardinal role of youth play in the shaping the digital world, right? Particularly in internet governance. The youth's presence in the real of, of internet governance is not just pivotal, it's transformative, right? With your unique perspectives and innovative ideas and your inherent ability to, to passion and adaptability to inject into these IC processes, ensure that this evolving framework that we are seeing is not only technical, but also socially relevant, right? Inclusive and forward looking. The Internet Society, recognizing the, the immense potential, uh, has been tireless in its efforts to uplift, uh, mentor, and champion the young voices. The Youth Ambassador Program is just a facet uh, of these endeavors. Beyond this, they are a mere a myriad of initiatives, collaborations, and projects that are tailored to cultivate uh, this harness of the power of the youth, as we said. Uh, the Society's commitment extends to the creation of platforms that are actively involved in dialogues, decision making, and also in leadership roles, as we have seen. The Youth Coalition that, the, that I am part uh, is the, and the Youth Standing Group, that is the, this uh, ISOC Special Interest Group that now is uh, with a standing uh, status, are shining example of, of this that I, I am saying. This platform are, are, if, are for youth, but are led by them, right? So creating this synergy of ideas, aspiration, and actions in the, in the Internet Society, uh, exploring underlying like the Internet Society mission and vision, right? To, to have like this global, open, and interconnected network. Uh, the youth voice isn't just an addition, it's essential for, the, for this future. So the Internet Society mission, as you know, as its core, is about inclusivity and empowerment. So fostering these youth-centric platforms and initiatives and the collaboration between these initiatives uh, is investing in a future where, where the Internet governance is diverse. So let's focus on today's session we are here at the Collaborative Leadership Exchange. Uh, this session has been uh, take, taken place several years at the ICF, and the main objective is, as you know, networking, creating and fostering relationships between the, the ambassadors and also the alumni, right? Uh, because there are people that are former youth ambassadors as well and keep continuing participating, exchanging these revolutionary ideas about community networks, we have projects related with internet fragmentation, a uh, lot of topics addressing these, these crucial internet governance issues, right? So, designed with these presentations and the collaborative discussions we will have, and uh, now Prana will mention a, a little, we are committed to translating these conversations into tangible actions, right? So, many of the insights today will emanate uh, from the new cohort of the youth ambassadors, as I said, there are 15 people, so I am very glad to, to be here with you. And well, with, uh, with these interactions, we, we ensure this global perspective, right? The, the idea is to forge ahead and remember us that the collective mission is to shape an internet that remains open, trustworthy, and beneficial for everyone. So we, you, the youth, are not just participants, we make sure of that, because you are the driving force of the internet governance. So with this, I, I take the floor to, to Pranav, Thank you. Uh, well, thank you and, and be part of this transformative journey together. Hello, everyone joining online and in person. I'm Pranav. I'm an empowerment advisor at the Internet Society. And more importantly, I was myself an early career fellow of the Internet Society. And I'm so happy to be hosting the Youth Ambassador Program and uh, the Collaborative Leadership Exchange of Internet Society, where we have 15 of our youth ambassadors joining us. Some of them are joining online, and many of them are joining us in person today. And uh, I'm so happy to share that the ambassadors come from diverse geographies and diverse stakeholder groups. And, uh, they will be sharing about some really interesting issues pertaining to internet governance today, from uh, making standards relevant to end users, to fragmentation from women in coding to aspects of generative AI. From uh, Our fellows will be highlighting on the role of youth in bridging the digital divide and so many other interesting topics. Um, allow me to share the format of this event today. This won't be a usual conference. Uh, we're ensuring that this is hyper-engaging and, uh, and interactive for all of you. 
So after uh, this flow, the, the idea will be that uh, the fellows will be coming up and sharing their project initiatives in brief two minutes. Th that will be giving you a high level understanding of what their project initiative is about. First, we'll have the ambassadors joining online share their initiatives and then the in-person ones. And after that, they will be taking seats at different uh, parts of this conference room and also in the online breakout rooms. And you can go and interact with them. That will be your chance to understand the topic better, seek more inputs, give feedback, seek feedback, connect them with other people that you find would be relevant for them, and grow together. And they, these will be two 15-minute sessions followed by a break. And the idea will be you can shift between, after the first 15 minutes, you can shift to another ambassador and hear from them. And then we will have round two of such a similar uh, sessions. And then we will close by, uh, with the ambassadors coming in and sharing their outcome, that this is what we discussed and this is what we learned from our discussions today. So with this, I will now hand it off to Tori to uh, bring in our ambassadors joining online. Thank you so much, Pranav. Um, I hope you can hear me in person. Um, I, I, my name is Tori. Um, I am lucky enough to run our Youth Ambassador Program. So I'm very excited that you all get to see and talk to our ambassadors that I get to talk to every week and hear all of their amazing ideas um, how they can really impact the internet community. So I wish them all well. And with that, I will stop talking and hand the mic over to some of our youth ambassadors who are with us online. Um, so the first one I see is Caroline. Caroline, are you able to talk to us? Hello. Hi, Caroline, we can hear you. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Caroline Tarus. I am a youth ambassador. I am uh, from Kenya, and I'm currently doing my master's here in, uh, in the United States. I'm doing a cybersecurity and data privacy law. Yeah, so I currently have an initiative with my friend, with my fellow ambassador, uh, who will be talking about um, providing education and awareness to, we'll be educating the youth on cybersecurity. I, I believe that right now, um, the internet has become, sorry, just a second. Yeah, the internet has become such an increasing vital part of our daily lives today and the youth being the largest consumers, I believe that the involvement in internet governance and also the educating them is very, very important. And I believe that um, it's important for them to be empowered in their cybersecurity and data privacy rights as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. The next one to introduce their topic is Ida. Ida, can you talk? Okay. Hi, Tori. So I was struggling a bit to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. So hello, everyone. My name is Aida Padikonate, and I'm from Ghana, and I'm excited to join you all today. So my topic is on online safety and etiquette for young people and for kids. Um, as a youth ambassador with the Internet Society and with other organizations, I'm really passionate about young people and about the work that they are doing and their impact on the society. And that is why I chose this topic. So to start with, um, in today's digital era, navigating the online world can be both exciting and challenging, especially for us as young people and for kids as well. As technology enthusiasts and as a generation that breeds the internet, we often find ourselves exploring the vast internet landscape, connecting with friends, sharing data and learning new things. However, Amidst the fun, it's crucial to prioritize our safety and practice proper online etiquette. So this project aims to discover the do's and don'ts of online interactions, 
from safeguarding personal information to fostering a respectful online community. This project also aims to equip young people with essential skills to thrive in the virtual realm responsibly. So in simple terms, my project is supposed to help young people gain knowledge and ensure their online experiences are not only enjoyable, but also secure or respectful. And I'm hoping to achieve this by having workshops and webinars and educational materials that I'm going to um, share amongst young people and also use to educate young people. I also want to take advantage of emerging technologies such as virtual reality to provide educational resources um, for young people and make sure that they are safe online. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aida. Uh, lastly that I see um, is Nana Ama. Uh, Nana, can you uh, share your uh, topic idea, please? All right. Hi, good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you may be. It's currently dawn in Ghana, so my voice may sound a little bit hoarse. Pardon me. So my name is Nana Mayabuado, and I'm Ghana, and the current youth ambassador with the Internet Society. My initiative is um, dubbed Empower Hair which is a groundbreaking initiative at the forefront of driving digital gen equality. Given the rapidly evolving digital landscape, where opportunities are abandoned, but barriers persist, I believe it's important that I set up an initiative that would stand as a beacon of change. So with this initiative, the aim is to have um, a path to a more equitable and inclusive digital world. And I believe this starts with empowering women. Um, my initiative is not just focused at addressing the gender gap, but turning it, you know, especially starting in Ghana, where I currently reside. So I'm passionate about um, make, creating a community of change makers and advocates who are dedicated to unlocking the full potential of the average Ghanaian woman. The mission of this um, initiative is to provide rural women with skills, knowledge, and support to help them thrive in the digital re realm. So I would entreat every to um, join me on the journey. Technology has become a tool for empowerment, and my initiative is solely focused on replacing the barriers with bridges where every woman or girl has the opportunity to not only participate in the digital revolution, but also to shape it. So collectively we can change the, the story as it stands now and have a more gender equal and digitally inclusive world. Thank you. Thank you so much. All these topics sound fascinating. Um, so for our online participants, you can join our breakout rooms um, to pick one of our amazing ambassadors and get to talk more about their idea. And with that, I will send it back over to Pranav and the ambassadors uh, there in person in Japan. Thank you, Tori. And uh, with this, we now come to the ambassadors who are joining us in person. And first, I would like to call upon Yuk Desai. And uh, he's working on a project initiative uh, titled Making Standards Relevant to End Users. Over to you, Yuk. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session. So my topic is uh, making standards relevant to end users. And uh, by this, I don't mean that we need to create standards that uh, end users can use. What I'm trying to do here is to make sure that end users understand the importance of standards and they educate themselves about standards and standardization processes. Standardization, prima facie, is a very boring topic. And as a non-technical person, you would probably run away from it. But it impacts all aspects of your life. And especially in the context of, context of the internet, it, aspect, it impacts how you use the internet and how internet goes on to shape your life. So standardization uh, of late ha is a is, has multi-dimensional impact on the society as a whole, on the economy, the supply chains, 
on how things interoperate. And of late, there is also increasing awareness that standardization goes beyond this. It also has human rights implications. It has implications on how people are able to connect to the internet, how they are able to access the internet. And uh, standardization is also seen as a technical form of governance. So at the Internet Governance Forum, we're obviously talking about regulation, but it is also possible to govern the internet through technical standards. So it, it is very important that we realize how standards, how values are being embedded in standards or how ethics are being embedded into standards. And so these are some of the ideas that I'm beginning with. And what I want to do today through our exchange is to get your point of view on how standards uh, are relevant to people. Why should end users concern themselves with standards? And whether they should do this in the first place or should it be left to the people who know the technical nitty gritties of the technology? And uh, second qu question is, of course, how do we do this? How do we do this together? How do we ensure that uh, we can make an average end user aware of standards and how it is impacting their everyday life? Thank you. Thank you, Shu. Thank you so much. Now I'd like to give the floor to Daniel Turra from Italy. Please share with us your experiences and perspectives. Thank you. Hello there, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniele Turra, and I would like to talk today about uh, open source software in social media, uh, also known as the Fediverse. And I would like to tease you with a couple of questions. Um, for example, what if we had multiple different social media platforms based on open source software? And what if those could be managed and moderated by any skilled organization or individuals for the benefit of everyone. So the Fediverse is a collection of interoperable and independently run social media servers that uh, are able to communicate with each other. So the underlying protocol makes this uh, possible, just like um, um, the same concepts underlined for uh, emails, but also for social media. So this free and open source software promises to give users back some control of the internet by allowing self-hosting and experimentation. This also makes possible learning about the inner workings of the internet, not only at the applicational layer. So can we achieve digital sovereignty and learning in the meanwhile? So in this session, I would like to discuss together open points regarding the use of open source software for digital sovereignty, opportunities for capacity building, and what can every one of us do in this context uh, regarding open source software? So if you're interested, just join the session. Thank you, Daniele. I would now like to call upon Jeremy and share about his work ab around Youth IGF Myanmar. Hello. Uh, so uh, I'm Jeremy. I'm from Myanmar. Uh, today, I just would like to point out the uh, digital divide and inclusion. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, introduce you about the YNGS Myanmar. So uh, UINGS Myanmar is kind of like the, uh, one of the U internet governance uh, foreign initiatives uh, like the other nations. We are just trying to organize the uh, specific forums that are uh, particularly uh, that, uh, that is describe the issues uh, pertaining to the internet uh, area from the youth perspectives according to the NRI principles. And we also have like the Akabeot uh, mission and visions. So uh, our vision is to advocate internet governance uh, for a meaningful, inclusive, trustworthy, and safe internet through YNG and Myanmar. So uh, we have like the four uh, uh, missions to raise awareness of internet governance policies and issues among young people. Uh, to place the internet governance community and Myanmar youth from shaping the harmonious internet community. And the third mission is to encourage youth participation in regional and global IGF to discuss and reach internet issues. And the last, uh, the last one is to empower uh, future generation to organize the annual youth internet governance forum in Myanmar in, in accordance with our core values, open, transparent, inclusive, Bottom F and Stiari, the multi stakeholder collaboration. So, this is the uh, pre introduction of YGS Myanmar. So, uh, today my topic is 
kind of like the digital divide and inclusion. So uh, why do we need to know about this? Yes, two minutes. Yeah. So uh, we, we, we firstly, we just need to know about why digital divide. So digital divide is kind of like the different opportunities to assess the modern digital, digital technologies between the individuals or the groups or the countries. So why uh, there was happens, there are a couple of reasons that caused the uh, digital divide uh, based on the geographic area, gender, education, and other anywhere social economy status that caused the digital divide. So uh, why is the impact of this? There are a couple of uh, Invest like the unequal opportunities to assess the education, healthcare, and economic development, and also like the civil engagement. So this is the kind of like the impact of the digital divide. And also, why do we need to, uh, do we also need to uh, like to know about the digital inclusion? Digital inclusion is quite kind of like the, the opposite of the digital divide. We have to try to make sure all individuals and communities to assess the uh, digital communication technology, uh, regardless of age, gender, geo geographical condition. So why digital inclusion is important? Uh, uh, through digital inclusion, uh, time-based community and people could be able to uh, assess different kind of opportunities. And also like uh, uh, by assessing uh, digital technology and internet con connectivity, and also uh, uh, how can we make sure to uh, to afford the digital inclusion? Uh, we can like the uh, various stakeholders have to work together to a more uh, equitable and inclusive digital community. Uh, through as, through this issue, uh, we can hope to a more inclusive digital society in the future. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It's really great to hear about your Utah ICF initiative. So now we'll hear from Paola Corporal from the Dominican Republic. So Paola, the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Paola Corporal. I'm a US ambassador from Dominican Republic. And I'm pretty glad to be here. And I learned something in uh, Nigeria that you need to make an impact. And I would like to say that by five years from now, I'm maybe gonna be the next, um, 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 the next Ministry of Public Innovation of the Dominican Republic. So nice to meet you. <laughs> and um, you know, uh, my initiative is about women in coding. I'm from Dominican Republic. I'm the head of public innovation of the Dominican government. And working in, in public innovation, I've seen that uh, it's important the collaborative perspective in, in building a strategy, building public policies. And I'm in charge of promoting the culture of public innovation. And my project is about engaging girls in, in coding, girls in, um, in the public innovation projects. So um, by my project, I will be doing a, a policy paper itself, and I will be using a case study of a group of girls that are now learning how to code. And that's the purpose is to massificate that initiative in all the Dominican government, um, using and, and then analyzing how it's um, um, engaging girls in, in, in coding, impacting the public innovation of the Dominican government. So I will be glad, glad to be uh, talking about this topic, and nice to meet you all. Thank you, Paula. We look forward to, your, uh, to hearing more about your project initiative. And now I call in Athenis. He's from the, Demo uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and will be covering this topic on internet fragmentation. Thank you so much, Pranav. I'm Atanas Baizir from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, internet fragmentation. Uh, currently, we are experiencing uh, internet fragmentation in many sorts, and actually in uh, South uh, parts of the world, like South countries, this is happening uh, in the form of internet shutdowns. At some point, the internet is just uh, being uh, shut down by uh, the uh, 
the government just because of some political issues or in uh, ele uh, election periods. So uh, um, what I'm trying to do is to assess the economic and societal impact of the shut shutdowns, like what are we losing when we are having the shutdowns and uh, what are the alternatives we can have to tackle these issues without having to shut down the whole internet. So uh, the idea is to have alternative solutions that we can present to the government, what, uh, showing them how much we are losing when we're having shutdowns and what uh, other solutions we can uh, uh, use to prevent uh, these shutdowns. So uh, I would be very happy to discuss with you all if you have some tactics or some cases uh, you have gone through or what we can do to make sure this is no longer a problem. So I would be very happy to discuss this with you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ethnies. And it was so nice to hear from all the fellows. Let's energize this room with a round of applause. <laughs> awesome. So now that we've heard from... Edgar is here. All right. Hi, Edgar. Would you please come up and uh, share about your project initiative on generative AI? Please, my apologies. So hi, I'm Edgar uh, from Georgia, country, not state. Uh, so the problem in my country is generative AI and disinformation actually, which comes mostly from Russia. As you might know, my country is occupied by Russia, as now Ukraine. Uh, so we are in hybrid warfare with this country, and in my country there are many ethnic minorities. Uh, I'm also a representative of ethnic minority in my country, and Russia always used generative AI, uh, especially deepfakes to pit people against each other uh, and to cause separatism uh, in Georgia. Uh, that's why I decided to uh, work on, I have like um, desk research, uh, to uh, work on initiatives, how we can regulate, for instance, media in Georgia to ensure that there is no disinformation, but at the same time, since Georgia is hybrid democracy and is very vulnerable to authoritarian tendencies, we also ensure democratic development of this country. So it's uh, very tricky, I mean, uh, so it's very tricky because uh, like when you have censorship of media, uh, you like ensure national security of your country, but on the other hand, uh, there might be authoritarian tendencies in your country. And unfortunately, current government of Georgia has authoritarian tendencies because it's pro-Russian. I will speak broadly if uh, during round tables. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar. Any other ambassadors hiding somewhere? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we had, uh, we've heard from the ambassadors and uh, they've been covering, as we said, we heard about generative AI, we heard about internet fragmentation, we heard about women who code, we have heard about youth IGFs. So it is now the time where, when these ambassadors will be moving towards breakout sessions. The online uh, ambassadors joining us online will be having breakout sessions virtually and those in person will be taking spots within this room so whoever's topic, whichever topic uh, really interested you, please uh, move towards those ambassadors and have a discussion with them. And I will then remind you all in 15 minutes at 10 a.m. GST to then uh, shift to another ambassador and then we can have another round of discussion. So this is your moment to, again, uh, take feedback, give recommendations, build networks. So over to you folks. Hello everyone. Thank you for everyone who joined the session in person and online. It meant a lot that you joined. And uh, each year the Internet Society chooses 15 young passionate people to participate in our Youth Ambassador Program, equipping the next generation of internet leaders to collaborate and innovate for a better world. I'm happy to share that the applications for our 2024 cohort are also now open. Please do reach out to us if you have any questions about the program or the application process. Now I will uh, invite the youth ambassadors to share the outcome of the discussion, and I will first request Tori 
to facilitate the outcome sharing by ambassadors who joined online. Over to you, Tori. Yes, thank you so much, Pranav. Uh, really great conversations going on here online. Um, so with that, uh, I will bring it over to Nana, if you could share first um, your closing remarks, how the conversations went, uh, share a little more about your topic and your initiative uh, with us. Nana, can you hear us? I think she might be having some technical difficulties. So I will bring it over to Caroline. Caroline, can you hear us? Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Oh, now we got both of you. Oh. <laughs> okay, Caroline, you can you can take the stage. Oh, okay. Um, good morning. Uh, once again, this is Caroline Tarus. Uh, from Kenya, a lawyer and uh, advocate of the High Court, currently based in the US. Um, like I said, my, my initiative is about empowering the youth with knowledge and skills on cybersecurity and data privacy. Um, since I have a legal background, my initiative is to empower individuals with comprehensive knowledge of digital, digital rights and legal principles within the context of the online world. And the main purpose is to bridge the gap between the complex legal concepts and everyday digital experiences and fostering awareness and understanding. This is because uh, the youth out here are afraid of you know, reading the law and regulations because of the complex legal jargon. So my aim is to like, break it down to them and also give them uh, the information in a, in a plain, easy way through product videos, uh, conducting workshops, and all that. So I had a fruitful discussion uh, during the breakout uh, where I met uh, Umut uh, Pajero and also Theo Dor. Yeah, so I shared my initiative with them. They gave me uh, insights on how I can also improve the, uh, on my initiative. I spoke with one of the alumni of the Internet Society Youth Ambassador, and she was really helpful in. in giving me the insights on how I can improve the initiative. So it was such an honor to speak with uh, the, these people on my initiative. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Now over to Nana, if you can unmute now. Hi, finally, thank you, Tori. Um, so basically, I just want to say that based on the conversations that have been had over the past two hours, it's just like reinstated the fact that the power of change lies in our collective efforts. Because I came in here with a very clear picture of what I knew my initiative to be. But based on the conversations that I've had, I've I've actually had so much insights and a clearer perspective and for that I'm very grateful. So I just want to um, highlight that my project, although it focuses on bridging the digital divide in rural Ghana, specifically targeting women, it's not just about, you know, teaching digital skills. It's also about nurturing dreams fostering independence and just like fueling the flames of innovation because when you give women the tools, when you give women the opportunities, it's not just going to just bridge the divide, but it's also going to build bridges to a brighter future. So I just want all of us to have this at the back of our minds and, you know, extend a helping hand wherever we can in, you know, taking people along on this journey to make it a more inclusive and better world. Thank you very much. It's been an insightful discussion. Thank you. Oh, so many amazing quotes there. Uh, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. 
Uh, lastly, we have Ida. Uh, what would you like to share from your discussions today? Ida, if you're talking, um, I see two of you, you've multiplied yourself, uh, but you're muted. Yeah, I see one of you is un unmuted. Okay, hi, Tori. Okay. Hi, there you are. Issues here with my internet, so I had to get a backup plan. That's why there's two of me. Right, so... <laughs> Yeah, so um, like I mentioned earlier, I'm Ida from Ghana, and uh, my initiative is on online safety for young people and for kids. And um, I'm really excited that I was here and I got to connect with other alumni and other resource persons here. Um, in my breakout room, I connected with Theoros and uh, Mauritia, Tori, and Umat. And through Theoros' discussion, I realized that she was working on a similar project. But hers was for kids, and she was working on an encryption coloring book, and it was really inspiring. And I also like got more information about the Ghana ISOP team, since I'm in Ghana. And I'm looking at ways in which I can collaborate with them in terms of the resources that I need to ensure that I'm able to execute my workshops and webinars here in Ghana. Um, I also spoke with Mauricia, who told me about the Global Encryption Day, which I hope to engage with and also learn a thing or two to inculcate on my project. And I spoke to Umut, who is connecting me to resources that I can also use in executing my project. So it's been very insightful. I've learned a lot. And if you're still here and you have some resources that would benefit my project, I'm open to, you know, connect with you, hear you, collaborate with you, and even to my other youth ambassadors, if you'd like to collaborate, you can always hit me up and we can work on projects here together. So thank you. Thank you, Tori. Thank you so much. Uh, sounds like great conversations all around. We really appreciate everyone online who was able to join and give input. Uh, this is really what it's all about. Everybody sharing their ideas and making the projects and the internet better. So really uh, heartening to hear that. Um, so thank you all so much. And with that, I'll bring it back to Pranav. Thank you, Tori. And thanks to Caroline, uh, Nana, and Ida for sharing the thoughts. It was so nice to understand how uh, the discussions enriched their understanding and their work around the project initiatives. And now let's reignite the discussion back in the workshop session. And I will first ask Herman to come up and share more about his project initiative and the discussions he's had today. Over to you, Herman. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. It's really a pleasure. Ah, okay. Thank you very much, Pranav, Nicolas and all my colleagues and friends from the Youth Ambassador Program. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all after a very short trip of 30 hours to Japan. So yeah, just to, to be real quick and then give back the word to all of you. Uh, mainly, I've been working on internet fragmentation and particularly the topic that I'm interested in is how uh, net neutrality might be affected with some measures regarding zero rating in Colombia what we're seeing is a particularly, let's say, ambiguous trade-off in some developing countries, such, in, such as Colombia, where we had to choose between uh, net neutrality and zero rating in order to provide some sort of connectivity for our citizens. So the issue is that in Colombia, we, we have a, around 60% of the population connected to the internet, and one of the main barriers that we're seeing is that Connectivity is just too expensive for most of them. So a solution that has appeared is zero rating. That is, that some applications, some programs, some contents might be accessed at no charge to the consumer. Of course, that's a reasonably good solution, but when we look around the implications of these kind of measures, we realize that we need to have a more 
um, wide understanding on what's going on. Because in the end, what's happening is that we end up having like two levels of the internet. One level, that's the internet that everyone can pace and that has access for all of its contents. And then we have a different level where only uh, applications and contents under zero rating might be used by the users. So we have to face this challenge because in the end, the problem is not that zero rating exists because it's solving an issue that it's in the way that we use internet in Colombia, but rather how we can make connectivity more uh, accessible and how we can make it more affordable for everyone. So the point of my investigation is uh, dwelling into a conversation that is happening in the Colombian Constitutional Court regarding that issue and see what might be the impact that this decision might have on how zero rating is being understood in the Colombian legal system as well as what the implications might be regarding the zero rating measures that are being studied by the Constitutional Court. Th and thank you very much. Thank you, Herman. It was nice to hear about your project initiative and uh, with this, uh, I would now like to invite Hugh Desai, and uh, he will be uh, sharing more about his work on making standards relevant to end users. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the insightful conversations that we had in the last hour. I got some very interesting ideas about how to take this forward. Um, one of the discussions was about having a human-centered design and uh, also prioritization of the end user in the process itself. Uh, there's also the question of translating the technical language and an interesting suggestion was to have these standards documents also create some key messages as is done in the case of legal regulations, but perhaps we can also include that in these technical documentations so that the end user can, can understand the broad message, application and impact uh, that standards are having. Uh, obviously, there is a need for uh, awareness campaigns using infographics, webinars, so that the, uh, the, your average end user can uh, get involved in standardization and also it can be easily demystif be de demystified for them. Uh, design standards are also important, so standardization at the application layer is something that directly impacts the user and therefore uh, issues such, such as deceptive patterns uh, become important. So standards around design practices are also crucial for ensuring that the end user can uh, interact with the applications uh, properly. Uh, there is also uh, the open source community at large and uh, their participation in creating and maintaining and propagating open standards so they can, their role in uh, sort of ensuring that the end user understand what standards are about is, is quite critical. So that was also underscored in the discussions. Um, so yeah, th those are some of the thoughts and also um, the ethical implications of standards, especially in the context of emerging technologies like artificial intelligence and metaverse are crucial. So through these discussions around the ethics, uh, we can find a way to make sure that the technical standards that come out of various processes related to this, these emerging technologies are, are robust and uh, can actually address the challenges and the needs of the end users. Thank you. Thank you, Yug. You covered quite a few many bases, impact, ethical considerations, awareness and, uh, or, and deceptive practices within the standardization remit. Uh, it was a very nuanced discussion, great. And uh, with this, I'll now call in Daniele and he will be sharing on aspects of the Fediverse. Thank you so much. Uh, the conversations were so heated I had to uh, take off my jacket. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, so our conversations uh, mostly move towards the idea of digital sovereignty and how open source can actually sustain it. And of course, we also talked about the relevance of open source communities in uh, this specific context. So the idea is that also in the supply chain that um, is backing up uh, the development of open source software, uh, we have to consider all kind of actors involved in this. 
and how this uh, may actually relate to digital sovereignty. So state actors uh, can have an important role uh, in all of this and therefore they can actually be used and participate effectively to sustain uh, the, the usage and the adoption of uh, open source software um, also regarding the Fediverse and uh, alternative social media. Um, so also there are some still open questions uh, we couldn't really discuss, such as uh, if the application layer in the specific context might be used for leveraging um, education uh, on the lower layers of the internet, uh, but also uh, if there are uh, opportunities to teach people and introduce them to internet governance uh, by talking about social media and moderation in, in general. So there are seem still other uh, open points, so uh, please feel free to reach out to me through the email we showed us before. Um, thank you. Thank you, Daniele. The relevance of the open source community cannot be highlighted enough, and it's so interesting that you've also uh, left us with some open questions to engage with, and uh, we'll be definitely be sharing the email IDs again, and uh, we'll reach out to you. And uh, with this, I'd now like to call in Jeremy to share about his work around, uh, in, on youth IGF in Myanmar. Uh, so, uh, now actually, uh, I'm not sharing about the UINGF. Uh, firstly, I want to share you about the uh, uh, the discussion that that was uh, I just discussed with the uh, graduate student from Osaka University. So, uh, uh, she uh, her research topic is kind of like the uh, the uh, how the Japanese young people are use the social media pl uh, platform, especially the Twitter, in their daily life communication. So, this kind of stuff. Yeah, th we have discussed a lot about this issue. So uh, today, mainly, I, I would like to uh, talk about the gender digital device. Pre previously, I just uh, mentioned about the digital device and inclusion. So uh, gender digital device is kind of like the different access to the uh, technologies uh, between the men and women. And also, there are uh, prior to your reasons that cause the gender digital device, kind of like the uh, differences in the social so socioeconomic status kind of like the uh, level of digital skill and also like the level, the op opportunities for the women uh, to get access to the uh, digital, digital uh, devices and also like kind of like the affordable internet services or uh, this kind of stuff. So uh, there are uh, kind of like the so many uh, ways we can address the issues. Uh, uh, the first uh, alternative uh, solution is kind of like we can promote the uh, digital literacy, lit literacy skills for the for the women through trainings or the education programs, and the second alternative way is to make sure connect the internet uh, uh, with by providing the affordable internet services and digital device, and also like uh, the last uh, alternative is to uh, to uh, create the uh, job opportunities for the for the women to purchase to be able to purchase the digital devices and afford the internet services. So through this action, we can uh, kind of like the promote the, the role of uh, participation of the women in the, in the kind of like the, uh, uh, the, uh, the accessible uh, uh, digital te technical role. So yes, that's over. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, thanks for sharing with us the solutions towards bridging the digital divide uh, and, uh, and the, gender di the gender digital divide. And, and that's a perfect segue to invite Paula, who's, who's been working on aspects of women in coding. And uh, really looking forward to hearing. Thank you so much. Um, for you that didn't hear my exposition um, this morning, my project is about uh, women in coding, and it's a program that was, I, I first met this program with a woman of Africa. She has this program called Girls in Coding, where they teach, uh, teach women from underserved community, especially girls from eight to 15 years old, uh, how to code. And then uh, it, the program was held in Dominican Republic. It has like one year where 
young women learn how to code, and we're integrating this program, uh, giving them the opportunity to code for the government, to use the perspective that they have from in their safe communities, and putting the solutions in governmental uh, problems, in governmental solutions that are needed. Uh, and the conversation was so interesting, uh, because uh, I got the, the perspective of German, where he told me that, um, in Colombia, they, they needed to teach the parliamentarian um, uh, people, the, uh, the Congress people, and also the, the people that work for the government, uh, this concept, because they not they are wrong always uh, know uh, those topics about internet of fragmentation, about women encoding, and we need to create uh, laws, we need to create public policies in order to promote this kind of, of of projects for for them to um, conquer uh, the women literacy in 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 technology. So um, it was so interesting for me to hear that and also to hear the perspective of other fellows about the digital divide, bridging the digital divide, and also integrating uh, human rights and the human development perspective. So it was so interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts on uh, building, uh, bridging the digital divide and connecting the unconnected is a priority area for ethnic society as well. And, and uh, thank you for sharing a deep dive into your interaction. And uh, with this, I would now like to call Athenis to share more about his uh, discussion on internet fragmentation. Thank you so much, Pranav. Uh, I had a very good discussion, actually, with uh, many of the colleagues here. Uh, Marco just mentioned something very important to me, and I think that I have to implement in my project as uh, working around internet fragmentation and alternative solution to uh, internet shutdowns. And uh, what he just mentioned is how we can uh, use the, uh, uh, sorry, I want to use his word, actually, how we can uh, use parliamentarians as our, our speakers to the government as uh, the people uh, to whom we speak to the government to actually raise more awareness uh, at the government level so that at least uh, when the government the best practices they can uh, implement and they can also put pressure on the government uh, on the uh, regulators one other thing that was mentioned uh, here is that uh, we can have case studies and toolkit uh, at least with case studies and stories uh, we can showcase to governments how bad is uh, these shutdowns and what we are losing from maybe a health perspective, from uh, an economic perspective, and from a civil society perspective. So uh, having case studies uh, is a really a very tool way of uh, expressing and uh, expressing the idea for the government. So uh, those are few of the solutions I thought uh, to myself, and uh, uh, my idea is to work uh, more, like do more research and uh, have uh, implementable solutions and uh, something that I can present actually to the government saying that, okay, uh, to avoid this, this are the alternatives that we can use. And uh, actually we will be going forward Thank you, Athenis. And uh, it's definitely working with parliamentarians is definitely a very effective way of furthering uh, one's advocacy on any policy or legal issue at hand. And uh, tool building toolkits and case studies is another one. And uh, 
we've been at and uh, as part of your training at the internet society you you have also worked on certain internet impact briefs which we often use for uh, advocacy and research and those serve as a very good briefing points for parliamentarians and other policy makers and uh, with this i would now like to call in edgar and who would share about his uh, work on generative ai yes i didn't forget you this time <laughs> Well, we talk, uh, actually, uh, I was engaged in many conversations about internal fragmentation, uh, sovereignty, etc. but I have to talk about my topic. Uh, I talked to former and current ambassadors and other colleagues here about generative AI, media, and disinformation, and like we talked about short-term solutions and long-term solutions as well, like community nodes of X, X is not popular, like no, Twitter, Twitter doesn't exist anymore. X, is it's not popular that much as Twitter, but it has a very good solution of short-term uh, short solution for disinformation, that's community nodes. Uh, but we also have to think about long-term solutions as well. Uh, that, that is like um, re reform of uh, media system in general. Uh, also, it's uh, quite good if we uh, learn um, best practice around the world to fit to Georgian reality. But also, one very important thing is that since Georgia uh, shares many things in common with Eastern European countries and with Caucasus region countries as well, so uh, the work done in Georgia can serve as an example for Eastern European countries as well. Uh, yeah, that's very briefly about um, our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar. And I thank all the ambassadors uh, for sharing their thoughts. And uh, that, was very, uh, that was very insightful. And uh, this does call for a round of applause for all the ambassadors here. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, with this, I will now invite Tori for a closing, uh, uh, closing remark for the online joinees. Thank you so much. Uh, it was so great to hear a little bit about your conversations in person, though we could not be there. So thank you all so much for sharing. And thank you to all the online participants. Um, really wonderful getting to uh, jump into all the different conversations here. The breadth of your work is really astounding. Um, a lot of work to be done in the internet, as we can see, but with you guys on the case, uh, I know we're in good hands here. Um, and so if any of the participants are interested in hearing more from our ambassadors, we will be having our end of program symposium on November 14th. So look out on the Internet Society social media channels for more information about that. So you'll get to hear even more from our amazing ambassadors um, if you join us there. Um, and with that, I will leave you with uh, Nana's words. I think they really encompass everything I learned today myself. Uh, the power of change lies in collective efforts. Uh, really beautiful quote, so thank you so much. Um, and back to you, Pranav. Thank you, Tori. And uh, for the join these in person, I would now like to invite Nicholas, who is our alum from the Youth Ambassador Program and the Steering Committee member of the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. Over to you, Nicholas. Thank you, Pranam, and thank you to all the youth ambassadors here for your contributions. Being in the room and hearing all your discussions were like very important to showcase the importance of the youth engagement, right? I was uh, hearing the, the discussions with Athanasia and Mark about internet fragmentation, and well, the, these alternatives, right, these solutions that you came up are, are the important part because we are discussing here what, what are the different methods we can solve the, the challenges we, we have. Also, uh, when talking about uh, Jeremy with the UTICF Myanmar, how to deal with countries that sometimes the governments are very reluctant on, on discussing the important things or, or having the conversations uh, with the younger generation, but, but it's very important uh, to maintain this youth engagement, right? To, to have the, the youth there. So having the youth discussing is really important. These fresh ideas and ways of thinking is, is what we, we, this is a key for the future. And well, the idea is to listen and work with the younger generations. And uh, thank you all for joining today. And well, this is, uh, see you the next time in the Collaborative Leadership Exchange. Thanks.